One of the great writings of the ancient world still read and studied today is the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible that for many readers speaks of a terrible future for the world and mankind, culminating with judgment and God's wrath being poured out on the earth. But Revelation unveils far more than cosmic destruction. It begins by revealing the heart of the resurrected Jesus for those he's left behind. On this day of discovery, author and Cornerstone University president Joe Stoll travels to modern Turkey to begin looking into this ancient book with a curious beginning, a series of seven letters, seven letters to seven churches of the first century. Joe looks closely into the words of these letters to uncover the mind and wisdom of Jesus as directed to his followers living in an anti-Christian Roman Empire. Journey to the seven churches of Revelation on this day of discovery. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. John begins his letter to the seven churches of Asia Minor by quoting Jesus Christ, who said, I am the Alpha and Omega, which meant he was the beginning and the end, the first and the last. The one who is, the one who was, and the one who is yet to come. I am the Almighty. That was a statement that these suffering Christians desperately needed to hear. It's a dangerous and confusing time for followers of Jesus Christ. More than 50 years have passed since his death on a cross and resurrection. And throughout the Roman world at the close of the first century, the disciples of Jesus and their disciples have spread the message and built a thriving church. But after the great fire of Rome occurred on July 19, AD 64, the Caesar, Nero, blamed this growing religious sect known as Christians for the fire. He did that to protect doubts about the part he had in causing the fire. What a brilliant strategy. <laughs> Blame the Christians. They were trouble anyway, claiming that God was greater than all other gods and greater than Caesar as well. The Roman world was filled with gods and was inclusive of the gods of people conquered into the empire Yet, in spite of their claim that Jesus was the only way, they continued to grow. But when the Emperor Domitian came to power in 81 AD, it was then that the Roman world became a world that Christians fit into less and less. And under his administration, that held to the traditional Roman religions and policies, there was a lot of bad news for followers of Jesus. As a result of the Domitian persecution, for his faith in Christ, the Apostle John, once the beloved disciple of Jesus in his youth, and for years the Bishop of Ephesus, is now an aging pastor 
imprisoned on the Isle of Patmos in the midst of the Aegean Sea. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man. After that statement about the eternal power and presence of Jesus Christ, John follows by recording a vision that he saw of Jesus Christ. A vision so terrifying, so awesome, that John falls down as a dead man. He records that he saw Jesus walking through the golden lampstands in long white robes with a sash of gold around his chest. His hair was like white with wool. His eyes were like a blazing fire. From his mouth came a double-edged sword and his voice was like many waters. That image of Jesus Christ it makes me think about all the ways that John saw Jesus. At the very beginning, you know, lost in the doldrums of his career as a fisherman, a young would-be Messiah rabbi comes to the shore, calls them from their nets to an adventure he will never forget. He saw him teach, holding crowds at his very word. He saw him make the blind to see and the lame to walk. He saw him as warrior champion when he chased the thieves out of the temple. He saw him at the Last Supper, where as the beloved disciple, he leaned against Christ's chest as they fellowshiped in that critical moment. And then he saw him mangled, tormented, naked on the cross, hearing his plea that John would care for his mother. And then he saw the resurrected Jesus Christ. And now, he sees Christ like he's never seen him before. And it's important for us to understand why this appearance of Christ is so very important to early Christians in these seven churches. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. One of the more interesting aspects of the vision that John saw of Jesus Christ is that he saw Jesus holding seven stars in his right hand. Now I know what the right hand means because all through scripture the right hand of God is a symbol of his power, of his strength, and of his might. But what about the stars? When Domitian's infant son died in AD 83, the emperor Domitian deified that child, uh, made him into a god. And they had a coin that showed this infant sitting on top of the globe, and around the infant's head were seven stars. Could it be that the seven stars were a symbol of the godlike power over the universe that the emperors held. Well, if that's the case, this image of Jesus is very important. For the empire that these early Christians would fear, uh, Jesus Christ held it in his right hand with superior power over it. And later Jesus says that each one of these stars are the elders of the seven churches, which would mean to me that these elders themselves would have power over all the hostile powers of the empire. I think that's a strong picture and something that these early Christians needed to keep in mind. This powerful vision of Jesus Christ as the mighty conqueror comes to John at a very interesting moment in his life. Because John is now in a cave on the Isle of Patmos in the midst of the Aegean Sea. He's been exiled under the rule of Domitian, the emperor who has launched a massive persecution of the early church. 
Up to this point, everything's been going pretty well, actually. But with Domitian's persecution, everything had changed. I think if I were John, I would be thinking all is lost. The demonic forces, the imperial cult, could it be that they have won? Could it be that John is thinking, I didn't think it would turn out like this. And then, in that moment, <laughs> Christ appears as the mighty, conquering warrior. Talk about a moment where you'd have confidence in your faith and courage to persevere. The vision of Jesus Christ rivaled any force in the empire. And it was a fitting beginning to the book whose basic theme is that in the end, Jesus wins. To better understand why these letters from Jesus were so needed by Christians in the Roman world, travel with me to Istanbul, to one of the most important museums in the world, to meet Dr. Mark Fairchild, a scholar who has spent many years of study throughout Turkey looking into the world of the first century. This is one of the most interesting locations in Istanbul, Turkey, and Dr. Mark Fairchild is the professor of Bible and religion at Huntington University in Huntington, Indiana. However, more important to us today, Mark is an expert in the early centuries that the church grew up. Uh, he knows much about the environment in which, for instance, the ch Christians in the seven churches of Revelation would have lived and experienced their lives on a daily basis. So Mark, welcome, and tell us a little bit about where we find ourselves. Well, thank you, Joe. Um, the Istanbul Archaeological Museum is one of the most important archaeological museums in all the world. During the more than 400 years that the Ottoman Empire existed, all the important biblical artifacts came back to Istanbul, and that's why they're here. Uh, what we see before us, for instance, are altars to unknown gods. Hmm. Uh, when Paul went to Athens, for instance, uh, he was perusing the artifacts and the altars, the statues in the Athenian Agora, and he also observed statues to unknown deities, and he used that as a, an opportunity to proclaim the true living God, not a God of wood or stone, but a God who truly lives. And certainly symbolic of the polytheism and the paganism of the world in which those early Christians had to navigate their lives. And, and he gave them hope hmm. at a time when these people were struggling with deities who could be very uh, unpredictable. How is it that bad things happen to good people? Well, it's because we don't acknowledge deities that we're not even aware of. And so there's a great fear among some of these people that we have to cover all the bases, to offer sacrifice even to deities that we're not aware of. Otherwise, who knows what's going to happen yeah. to us. So these were like the default position of worship. These were the just in case I miss somebody, yeah. I'm going to make a sacrifice to these altars right here. Mm -hmm. And what Paul says is the God that we worship is a God that is predictable, mm. and that if we serve him, mm. that we have security. Mm. And it was that security and hope in the early Christian's life that became a testimony to their world, wasn't it? It was magnetic that somebody believed there was something certain, and Jesus Christ had given them that. All of these statues remind me of what an idolatrous culture it was and how many of the temples and gods and goddesses totally controlled the entire economy and the social system, even this narrow hall, like how it, it closes in on us, how the gods and goddesses closed in on that culture. If you wanted to be a participant in the broader culture, you had to play the game. Even if you didn't believe that these deities existed, many people opted for philosophy as an alternative but you still had to be a participant in the cults. Which made it challenging for early followers of Christ who claimed Christ as their God. And they didn't have a temple, they didn't have idols. They must have been seen as a very strange group of people. And outsiders. Mm. And as a consequence, they encountered difficulties. They were persecuted. Sometimes they lost jobs. They lost economic opportunities and social opportunities. Many times were ostracized mm. within communities. Joe, this is a statue of Hermes, mm. 
the Olympian deity who was a messenger god and a god who transported people to the underworld. Wasn't this the god that the people, when they saw Paul and Barnabas doing miracles, that they confused their power in Christ with the power of the gods and started to worship them? Yes, in Galatia. And they interpreted Paul's miracles the way anybody else would. That is, they interpreted it in terms of the deities that they knew. Paul and Barnabas were proclaiming to them a different deity, not one of the polytheistic gods that they were familiar with. They had no space in their mind for anything except that miracles would only come from the gods and the goddesses. The thought of, that Christ would do this was not on their radar at all. Not until later on when Paul began to expound upon the gospel and to share in, in more depth who this God was. Mark, when John pens the letters that Jesus dictates to him, to the seven churches, I find it interesting. There's a lot of Johannine uh, thoughts and imagery in these letters that Christ gives to the churches. Yeah, John loves dualisms. And one of the things that John emphasizes, not only in his gospel, but also in the letters, is the fact that uh, we are strangers to this world mm. and that just as Jesus was not well received in this world, so also as his disciples, we're not going to be well received. So our identity, we have to understand uh, that we as scripture often says we're aliens here. In a sense, we don't really belong here, so we should expect some kind of friction and pressure. But then that leads to the theme that Jesus does in these books so often, in these letters to the churches, of eternity. But this, this world is not really finally fully my home, but there will be great reward in eternity forever. So it's the temporary and the eternal, isn't it? And as John writes in his letters, uh, 1 John, written at Ephesus, he says, friendship with the world is hostility towards God. We always have to remember that our eternal abode is not here. Mm that God has prepared a place for us. And he comforted his disciples in John chapters 16 and 17 by making reference to the fact that our world, what we should be aspiring for, is beyond what we see here. Yeah, I do think it's fascinating with the early Christians having that kind of sense, Mark, that yet they knew they were in the world and they brought the compassion of Christ into their world and the love of Christ into their world, which gave them a dynamic that people couldn't contradict. Maybe they could contradict their theology, but they engaged their culture with the love of Jesus Christ, which was really the power of the early church. And I think a message for us in our day as we experience increasing marginalization would be easy just to huddle down and wait for Jesus to come. And while we're not of this world, we are to be a dynamic force in this world for Jesus Christ by showing his love and compassion to those in need as well. Here is another great museum in Istanbul, the Hagia Sophia, formerly a church, then a mosque, and today a museum. A museum from which we can learn an interesting lesson from history that gives us a view of Christianity that stretches from the Roman world to the world in which we live today. As we enter the Hagia Sophia, these doors, like many of the other artifacts here, are rich in ancient history. But the thing I find interesting is that immediately you are welcomed with the sign of the cross and the name of Jesus Christ. Now that takes on particular meaning when you remember that these doors are from two centuries before the birth of Christ, from the town where the Apostle Paul, the writer of many of the letters of the New Testament, where he was born, the town of Tarshish. These doors were originally on the temple to Apollos, the pagan god who represented the power of the Roman Empire. Then they were taken down and brought here and put as the entry doors, and interestingly enough, ascribed with the cross and the person of Jesus Christ to mark this as a cathedral or a temple to the living resurrected Son of God. This beautiful array of lighting reminds me of the bold claim that Jesus Christ made when he came into a very dark world. He said, I am the light of the world. And he spoke that into a world in the dark grip of gods and goddesses and massive temples, images of wood and stone that could not help, could not hear, 
could not heal, could not see. But more than that, this massive cathedral stands today as a monument to the rise and the fall of Christianity here in Asia Minor, in the nation that we now know as Turkey. On this very site, soon after Constantine, the emperor of the Roman Empire, declared Christianity legal, a few years after that, in 360 AD, they built a Christian church here to the Logos, to Jesus Christ. Uh, rioters burned it and looted it. <laughs> you couldn't hold these Christians back. They built another one. And that one was burned and looted by rioters as well. And then in 532, plans were made to build this massive statement to Christianity. And this Hagia Sophia, Jesus Christ, the Holy Wisdom of God Cathedral, uh, stood here as the center of Christian influence throughout all of the East, all of the Byzantine Empire, until 1453. And then all things changed. By the year 1453 AD, all of Asia Minor, all of Turkey, had been conquered by the Ottoman Turks and Islam had become the religion of the region. But Constantinople, what we now call Istanbul, was the only holdout. In 1453, Mehmet II, the Sultan, victorious Sultan, marched into Constantinople and took it captive and changed this monument to Jesus Christ, the holy wisdom of God, into a mosque to celebrate the religion of Islam. As you can see behind me, the calligraphy signatures that date way back to the 15th century were placed throughout the building. And in a sense, then, this represents as well the fall of Christianity in Asia Minor. Although for political advantage, since the Pope was trying to take over the Eastern Church, Mehmet II decided to protect the Patriarch and to protect Eastern Orthodoxy. And so he built a small church for him on the Bosphorus. And even today there remains the presence of the Eastern Orthodox Church and the headquarters of the Patriarch here in Istanbul. But that was the change that turned the tide, that basically took the influence of Christianity out of Asia Minor. This ancient pulpit that, interestingly enough, decorates the patio of a coffee shop just outside the Hagia Sophia is probably from the second church that was built on this site in about 390 AD. But it's a reminder to me as a follower of Jesus Christ that the thing that has been central to believers throughout all of the centuries has been the proclamation of the Word of God. That the healing, transforming power of God speaking to us through His Word is what we hold on to and cling to. Now, I'm sure that many who don't follow Jesus Christ wonder why it is that we're so steady and so determined. Well, it's because God's truth has gotten a grip on our hearts. And quite frankly, it's encouraging for me to know that I don't just float through my generation alone, but that, that I have deep roots in the history of the church, represented by the proclamation of the Word of God from a pulpit just like this so long ago. You know, sometimes I wonder why we name our churches what we do, like first church of that, second church of that. Well, it wasn't so with the early Christians. They named their churches carefully after the things that were really important to them. Like the Hagia Sophia, Jesus Christ, the holy wisdom of God. Now that's got weight. That's important. The first church that was built on this site was named the Church of the Logos. Now, the early Christians in a Greek culture, they understood that the word logos was that place somewhere, that person somewhere that had all the answers to the meaning of life, all those questions that haunt us and daunt us. Somewhere there was meaning 
and somewhere there was, there was purpose. And when John wrote his gospel, he begins by saying, in the beginning was the Logos, speaking of Jesus Christ, the Creator. That in Jesus Christ is where all the meaning comes together, where life makes sense. And early Christians not only heard that, they experienced that in Jesus Christ. Uh, that's why they lived for him. That's why some of them died for him. So I'm fascinated by the fact that when they built the very first church on this site, they dedicated it to Jesus Christ, the Logos, the true meaning of life. And they dedicated it on December 25th, the birthday of their Savior, of their Logos. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and who is dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Amen.